You're listening to the ESO Network, your station for all things geek. The following podcast is scheduled for one fall. Coming in at 195 pounds from Studio A, he is the reigning, defending, undisputed host of the Ring of Thunder, Sexy Sexy. Thor! Guys, guys, Sasha Banks hit Boba Fett with a tornado DDT. I'll say it again. Sasha Banks tornado DDT'd Boba Fett with a little jetpack boost. Yes, that's right. Her character Cosca Reeves did come back uh, this past Friday in the season finale of The Mandalorian. And holy shit, that season finale. But that's a whole other discussion on a whole other podcast, possibly one that I'm also a part of. But yeah, she even dropped a little Sasha Banks-esque line of uh, Boba Fett will be talking through her back to tank using a very Sasha Banks tone of voice. And then she and Boba Fett, the most notorious bounty hunter in the galaxy, got into a little scuffle. And then, yeah, she hit him with a tornado DDT. I'm. It's been about three days. Yeah, three days. And I still can't get over it. It, it, it is amazing. And a couple of people who are also probably amazed are Johnny Gargano and Candice LeRae. Because they now have an official faction. They even have a name and everything. With those two, plus Indy Hartwell and Austin Theory. Their understudies or their children, or whatever you want to call them. And they are now just called The Way. And, of course, they're both big Disney nuts. They love Disney and Marvel and Star Wars and all that. So, now when they cut this promo introducing their new faction the way they didn't do a little wink nod wink nod this is the way sort of line which is what i would have done but i'm just cheesy like that but i mean i kind of i kind of felt those vibes like maybe they just kind of wanted to say it maybe just once but i don't know maybe a triple h was just like eh, maybe not or maybe they're more professional than me and they fought off the urge on their own who knows, but I'm here for it. Even if they don't actually say this is the way on NXT TV, I'll be like, I see you guys. Because I know they probably use Disney Plus a lot more than I do. In fact, they definitely do. And I use Disney Plus a lot. But also going on with NXT, Kyle O'Reilly versus Finn Balor for the NXT Championship at New Year's Evil. And Kyle O'Reilly had to beat Pete Dunne and what would have also been a very good match for a takeover or a special TV event. And also Karrion Cross will be taking on Damian Priest and will unfortunately probably eat him alive at New Year's Evil. Uh, Because of course Damian Priest like sort of called him out straight up to his spooky girlfriend. And so later on Karrion just drove right up. He threw Damian Priest through some stuff, and then he got back in his car and left. So now, match time until, of course, the inevitable of Karrion Cross versus Finn Balor. Be interesting when that happens, though, because, you know, there is a... I don't know when the next takeover is, but, you know, we got the Royal Rumble coming up, but that's like a few weeks before... Uh, yeah, no, two or three weeks, maybe three weeks. I don't know. Six or 31 minus six, 25. So yeah, it was like three or four weeks. And also there's probably a takeover before WrestleMania. But of course, I'm also thinking in, you know, timelines when wrestling shows, especially WWE would actually travel because since they've been taking place, it's just, you know, takeovers just sort of happen in their own time they don't have to be like the saturday night of a major pay-per-view case in point war games 
happen just like a couple weeks after Survivor Series when it's usually the night before, but that's because they're in the Thunderdome in the Capitol Wrestling Center, so they pretty much just, again, happen whenever they want. And also over on NXT UK, something very interesting was uh, A-Kid making the challenge to Walter for the NXT UK Championship. A-Kid is still currently the holder of the NXT UK Heritage Cup, which is like their sort of secondary title over there, I guess. But instead of like a, a strap to sling over your shoulder or wear around your waist, it's just, it's a big old trophy he's got to carry around. So that's neat. And Wal and then uh, Walter was just like, what? How dare you? I mean, you're a really awesome wrestler, but how dare you? And then Sid Scala was just like, you know what? In the new year, sometime in the new year, A-Kid will take on Walter for the NXT UK Championship. And so far, that's the only person I can think of that will be could possibly be the one to actually take that off Walter. And I'm wondering when exactly that time will be, because this April will officially make two years that Walter has been NXT UK Champion. I mean... I don't know, it's complicated because there is those few months earlier this year where there was absolutely no NXT UK, so I don't know how that factors into counting length of championship and also whatever decisions go on back there, but I would assume it would be almost about that time for that title to change hands if they wanted to, and so far... I mean, out of everybody there that's available, I would think A-Kid would be uh, the one to take it off him. I mean, of course, also th believed Ilya Dragunov would, could also very much be the one, but he was not. So, I don't know. We'll see. Maybe they're just waiting to again get fans back in the building because, yeah, whoever takes that belt off Walter, that is absolutely the about the British version of somebody taking a world championship off of a Brock Lesnar or somebody. So that would absolutely get major pops over in the UK. But I guess we'll see over in 2021, which is, I guess, fairly soonish. I mean, the, these days seem to be crawling a little bit towards the end of this year. So because of course it would. And also some really good news, Cody Rhodes and Brandy Rhodes announced that they are expecting their first child. So congratulations to the both of them. And also got to see Sting chase away Team Taz when they were about to pounce on Cody after, uh, can't even remember, oh, after his match with Angelica of the Hybrid 2. So Sting chased away Team Taz with his little baseball bat and his just general awesomeness. Uh, I just can't believe it. It's now like three weeks in a row that I've gotten to see Sting on live television. And it's just like, what is this year? What is life? Here in 2020, at 29 years old, I'm watching Sting on live television on TNT. I'm not sure when I'll get over that, and part of me hopes that I never actually get over that. That's why I just speak this perspective into this microphone, onto this recording, here for Internet Radio Land. So maybe you too can be like, oh shit, yeah, we are seeing like Sting three weeks in a row on live television on TNT in the year of our Lord 2020. Yeah. And also over on Impact, Kenny Omega will be teaming up with the Good Brothers, former Bullet Club mates, Machine Gun Carl Anderson, and Doc Luke Gallows, aka the OC2, because you remember they started out the year, the Good Brothers did, in the OC and the WWE, in a similar three-man group with AJ Styles, who is also formerly Bullet Club. So yeah, I will affectionately and positively, with no snarkiness or anything at all, we'll just call them the OC2, versus Rich Swan and the Motor City Machine Guns. They'll be fighting at the Hard to Kill pay-per-view on January 16th. 
and Kenny will also be facing Ray Phoenix during one of the 56,000 holiday themed dynamites coming up. Ray Phoenix was supposed to face Kenny in the AEW Championship number one contender eliminator tournament. That's a really long title for a tournament. But he had to be replaced by his brother Pentagon, who faced Ray in the first round, and then Ray had to pull out due to injury. So Pentagon ended up facing Kenny anyway. And of course, losing. So yeah, he'll be Ray Phoenix versus Kenny Omega sometime in the next couple of weeks. I don't remember wh where, when, where, how. So yeah, lots of exciting stuff coming up here in the next few weeks. And now enjoy some commercials, and we'll be talking about tables, ladders, and chairs. Are you tired of podcasts only covering good movies or bad movies? Where could you possibly turn to find both in one convenient place? There has got to be a better way! Well, now there is. Try the podcast Double Edge Double Bill, where Adam and Thomas dive into both a good and a bad film in every episode. Sound too good to be true? Well, listen to this testimonial. Double Edge Double Bill got me to watch Total Recall and Junior in one night. I was both entertained and scarred permanently. Thanks, Double Edge Double Bill. Available now on the ESO Network and wherever podcasts are streamed. My name is Mark McCrane. I'm the author of The Best Saturdays of Our Lives. I'm Dan Klink, co-host of The Best Saturdays of Our Lives podcast. The Best Saturdays of Our Lives features programming trends from the 1966 television season all the way through the last era of the early digital age of the 1990s. On the show, if it's animated, we talk about it. Order your signed copy today at tbsool.com. And listen to the podcast at esonetwork.com and all podcast platforms. Hello. Have you ever wondered how much Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster sold Superman's rights to DC for? Or which uh, popular football star was uh, the Sam Wilson the Falcons' physical appearance based on? You can find all that and more at the History of Comics podcast, a podcast dedicated to the creators, events, history, and the companies that made the great comic book medium. Hosted and created by your friendly neighborhood, J.T. Wheatley. Please listen, give it a listen at iTunes, Spreaker, Stitcher, and all our podcasting platforms. Thank you, and go ahead and enjoy yourself a good comic book. Look, we gotta talk. Yeah, Thunder Talk. We're going all kinds of sideways with that sweet nerd junk. Woke nerd junk. It's topical. Political. Dare I say radical. We've got all your latest news and reviews. Hot music. And a whole lot of comedy. But it ain't for kids. Definitely mature content. So let's talk. Let's talk Thunder Talk. Thunder Talk is a proud member of the ESO Network. So on to TLC. Started off, uh, the kickoff had an eight-man tag match. It ended with Biggie pinning Sami Zayn. And this was, of course, after the Sammy Awards on SmackDown, where Sami Zayn basically gave himself comeback of the year and match of the year. But then Biggie sort of rigged superstar of the year. So Sammy ended up reading his name and Biggie went up there accepting that award. And of course, on Sunday, there was audio, quote unquote, leaked of Sammy yelling at the production guys behind the Sammy Awards, like the audio of that was recently made news of Tom Cruise yelling at two guys who were standing less than a meter apart on the set of the new Mission Impossible. So, yeah, just a little uh, timely sort of thing WWE was doing. So, yeah. Also in that match, we're all over on Big East team where Otis and Chad Gable, who are still doing the Alpha Academy thing, where Chad is his coach, but everything he says isn't what he means because he's trying to teach Otis what he means when he says something completely different. I don't know. I'm just hoping... Uh, I'm just glad we're not at a Shorty G anymore. So, you know, I'll take it. And also the fact that that means there's more than two tag teams in the tag division. And on the... Oh, other side was Cesaro and Shinsuke Nakamura, who Chad Gable and Otis had been have been feuding with. And then, of course, on the good and bad side, to fill out the rest of the team was Daniel Bryan and King Corbin. Because, I don't 
think they were feuding or anything. No, because the last person we saw Corbin feuding with was uh, Murphy and Ray and Dominic. But Daniel Bryan was there as sort of his opposite opponent. So, uh, sure. I mean, anytime Corbin and Daniel Bryan get in the ring, maybe not necessarily together because I can't remember when they would be when they've feuded before in the past or if they have but yeah I mean anytime they're in the ring doing their thing it's cool but also and also with Big E pinning Sami Zayn that means and they announce later in the pay-per-view that on Smackdown it'll be Big E will be taking on Sami Zayn for the Intercontinental Championship I'm just like that's great and all like this is the push we've been waiting for for Big E but um, pretty sure Montez Ford has pinned Sami Zayn like twice last month. So where's his championship opportunity? I mean, whatever, whatever. <laughs> this is about Big E and we are here for Big E. And then the main pay-per-view itself started with the WWE championship tables, ladders, and chairs match. And there was some good action between Drew McIntyre and AJ Styles and then The Miz actually cast ugh, cashed in his Money in the Bank briefcase so now it was a triple threat and then he was actually on the ladder almost at the WWE Championship hanging up there after the WWE Championship Ascension Ceremony on Raw and he was there and he almost got to it until AJ's big old buddy almost took him and pretty much cradled him like a baby then threw him through a ringside table and then john morrison shattered a chair over almost's back and almost just no sold this and he slowly went after morrison backstage like he was flipping michael myers and now i want john morrison to just like over time hit him with a chair five more times and then be like i hit him six times well you know like Dr. Loomis and Halloween, you know, I'm a nerd, whatever. Drew McIntyre won, and Miz has disposed of the Money in the Bank briefcase that Creative has fumbled through this year and just totally botched. Better luck with the 2021 Money in the Bank plan. Oh, by the way, Drew McIntyre won and is still your WWE Championship. Sasha Banks beat Carmella to retain the SmackDown Women's Championship and treated her server slash butler slash employee friend guy Reginald who didn't have a name before the pay-per-view but at the pay-per-view was now called Reginald and she hit him with a meteora and pretty much treated him like Boba Fett and I'm pretty sure Reginald uh, does not have the sort of composure stiffness whatever the moxie of Boba Fett so he felt that a lot more he definitely didn't have the armor of Boba Fett or you know just any armor at all he just dressed really nicely because he still had a job to do and then holy crap the storytelling gone right the Hurt Business defeated the New Day to become new tag team raw tag team champions with no shenanigans I mean, the closest thing to shenanigans was uh, Cedric tagging himself in when Shelton was about to get ready to finish off Kofi, and Shelton was just, like, all bewildered, but he had to get out of the ring. And then Cedric hit Kofi with a lumbar check and got the pin, and then he was just being a little bit out there, like, ah! Like, so, eventually that's going to get on uh, his fellow Hurt Business Associates nerves but for right now Cedric's this sort of eagerness actually won them the day so good for them but even though I'm a big fan of New Day I just didn't feel that bad because I know New Day's gonna get it get it eventually I mean holy shit they're like what 10 time champions now and I'm pretty sure like I said I've only been following wrestling for about you know two and a half years now but I'm pretty sure I've actually and the New Day's been around since 2014 I'm pretty sure I've actually seen like or been there and 
watched live like half of their title wins. So I'm sure in the next six months, I will definitely see another title win somewhere down the line. I mean, especially if like, you know, since Raw literally has no other tag teams, you know, the, the, the New Day will be chasing after those tag titles again. And then this like, it's like they'll get it again by WrestleMania. Um, almost completely sure of it, which is again, fine with me because, you know, New Day is the best. Also, New Day rocks. New Day rocks. And then backstage, Billy Kay tried to give Asuka her resume and even had a mask, which was just a face drawn on a paper plate and glued to a stick. And she said she spoke Japanese, which she obviously does not. But Asuka said the position of her partner has been filled. To catch you up, after Lana pinned Nia Jax in a singles match on Raw this past week, Nia and Shayna injured her, so Asuka had to find a partner for the pay-per-view. It seemed like it was going to end up being either Dana Brooke or Mandy Rose, but it was actually... Charlotte Flair. The Queen is back. And if I popped as big as I did for Charlotte, I can only imagine how I'm going to be when Becky Lynch comes back whenever that is. Not going to lie, I used to be one of the ones who used to be like, Ugh, it's always Charlotte all the time in the big matches and getting the belt. And then for a split second, I felt like one of those who have the attitudes towards Cena or Roman, and I stopped that shit real quick. But mostly I had an epiphany that, I mean, anytime I've watched a Charlotte match, I've always had a great time. So, you know... Maybe I should stop being an asshole and treat the queen with the same reverence that I do for my tribal chief, your tribal chief, our tribal chief. I was also very excited to see her go head to head with Shayna Baszler for what I think is the first time. I can't remember if they ever faced off or not. Charlotte left in June and Shayna didn't do shit for the longest time after WrestleMania. So I feel pretty confident to say that they've never faced but yeah this is a wwe four horse women versus mma four horse women first time one-on-one -on -one matchup charlotte already faced ronda rousey twice in survivor series 2018 and wrestlemania 35 and if you're new to the podcast i have no problem talking about and referencing mania 35 a lot so now she faces a new mma horsewoman the match ended with Charlotte hitting Shayna with a natural selection and getting the 1-2-3. And now Asuka and Charlotte are the new women's tag team champions, which is the last title that Charlotte didn't have. So now she is a Grand Slam champion. Last year's TLC was Becky and Charlotte versus the Kabuki Warriors, Asuka and Kairi Sane. So it's a whole more things change, more they stay the same, or full circle comes around, or whatever saying you find applicable here. Of course, this is going to end sooner rather than later, with Charlotte going after the Raw Women's Championship, and I just hope A, they drop the belts to the Riot Squad finally, and B, Asuka gets her WrestleMania win back from Charlotte after she ended Asuka's undefeated streak at Mania 34. I have no problem with Charlotte becoming the next Raw Women's Champion before that. She can do it at, like, Elimination Chamber or Fastlane or some random episode of Raw. And one more side note before we move on. Apparently, Charlotte being the partner leaked online hours before the pay-per-view, but bully for me! The only social media app I have on my phone is Instagram, and also, I spent the day before the show grocery shopping and watching football so yay for living your life and not surfing down the internet black holes you -hoo! next up was what i and everyone else thought was going to be the main event and it was the universal championship tables ladders and chairs match between roman reigns and kevin owens I got worried for a second that Randy Orton vs. The Fiend got cancelled for whatever reason, especially when their go-home segment on Raw was Randy stuffing Bray Wyatt in a box, lighting it on fire, and The Fiend popping out and making Randy eat a mandible claw was just so terrific. 
and it turns out Roman did not castrate him like he basically said he would when he said he would take Kevin's manhood, but he did bury him under a shitload of tables, both on SmackDown and on this pay-per-view. Jey Uso also got involved a lot, and definitely made the save for Roman a few times when Kevin was on the ladder and had his fingertips on the Universal title. Even with Roman spearing him through a table, he managed to get out of the way when Roman tried to spear him again through the barricade. The tribal chief just ate all of that barricade. But it all ended when Roman got up on the ladder when KO was at the top. He hit him in the balls. So I guess that's some taking of the manhood right there. I don't want to get into it too much. Then he locked him in a guillotine till KO passed out and fell off the ladder. Roman took the title and remains your Universal Champion. Finally, we had the Firefly Inferno match, and I think reports of this being like every other Fiend feud has been greatly exaggerated to just plain wrong. I found myself a little nitpicky with the entrance because it seemed like the lights were turned up a little bit when usually his entrance is pretty dark, but <clears throat> whatever. I try to not be that person. Then his entrance title graphic said, The Fiend Bray Wyatt, when we had been doing such a great job the last few months of just calling him The Fiend because The Fiend and Bray Wyatt are supposed to be separate entities, but whatever. <clears throat> Eventually, I'm going to be doing some crossover work with the hosts of How to Talk to Your Friend About Wrestling, the host Amanda Bones, who is instrumental in getting Thunder Talk musical guests, and Ashley, and I'm working on pitching, trying to explain the deal with Bray Wyatt and The Fiend, like the story, like how you would explain that to somebody that doesn't, doesn't really w watch wrestling or follow it any sort of closely, starting from the beginning, like him being cult leader Bray, and of course I have to bring up Husky Harris, because that's important for when Huskus the Pig and the Firefly Funhouse is brought up, and it's just like, oh my god, oh boy, this is probably not something I can do from just the top of my head, so <laughs> writing time! Or And or I might just lose my mind trying to go into super detail about this because uh, this whole world is just madness. And even I, who's already just dived straight into the madness and is surviving and thriving, yeah, there's just that one little push where I just might go pop. And not like a happy pop, but just my brain will pop. But anyway, back to the match. The Fiend kept his jacket on, and Randy had his pants and hoodie still on, because the object of this match is to set a body part of your opponent on fire, so, you know, better cover up. Usually the fire comes out from the apron in normal Inferno matches, but the brilliance of the Thunderdome and no live fans being ringside is the flames can now come up from the barricade, so we have more room to work with. So naturally, the fiend pulls out a pickaxe, like you do. I mean, because sledgehammers are just so tame. Uh, sledgehammers are for the weak. I'm kidding, Triple H. Don't don't kill me. So he can just chop off. So he got a pickaxe. So he can just chop off one of Randy's limbs and set it on fire, I guess, or just stab Randy through the head. I'm not too certain. Then he gets Randy. A, Enough in a daze that the Fiend takes the old rocking chair, like the old Bray Wyatt used to rock in, and douse it with gasoline, and makes a line of gas, then puts Randy in the chair, then lights the gas, but Randy gets out of the way just in time. Towards the end, the Fiend just mandible claws Randy and pushes him towards the fire, but Randy reverses it at the last second and sets the Fiend's back on fire. Randy jumps back in the ring first, then when the fiery fiend gets in, he gets an RKO and the fire goes out. Who knew the RKO had extinguishing properties to it? The fiend is on his back and Randy is almost satisfied. Then he gets the gasoline, pours it all over the fiend, then lights him on fire. And the pay-per-view ends with 
Randy just staring at the fiend laying there, burning to death. See, in the world of kayfabe, people would think Randy Orton just burned a man with mental health issues to death and should be arrested. But if I were brought on an official show, and of course they would have to exaggerate my credentials as a, you know, well, well-known podcaster and host, which would then bring up the question, if I was so high profile, why didn't they bring me in to introduce the Thunderdome, the guy who has all the shows with fucking thunder this, thunder that, <coughs> hashtag sexy Thor for Thunderdome. I would say the people who say Bray Wyatt needed a psychiatrist only see a little bit of the picture. What that man needs is an exorcist, and that Randy Orton's punishment will not come from mortal law, but will come from the beyond, because Randy may have survived the inferno, but the fiend will be back, and he will bring the justice of hell with him, or something like that. Also, with the case of the missing Alexa Bliss, I'm starting to think maybe she didn't, maybe she didn't exit the story at the wrong time. Because once she finished filming Punky Brewster, she started her vacation she planned months ago, and that she's still on. So, at first I thought maybe WWE mistimed her being off TV, but really once Randy threatened her, there wasn't really any need for her in the story, for being honest. And this is me, I, I want to see more Alexa Bliss, that's never too much for me, but... So this is me saying it. If she ended up staying, they probably would have done something cool, but I don't think her missing detracted from anything considering where the story's headed. Randy had already threatened her, which fully provoked the Fiend, and it just needed to be between the two until the Fiend ultimately, quote-unquote, died. Which, God, would just what a, what a great twist, too, because I figured, you know, unfortunately, Somehow I got it in my brain that this feud was going to be a one and done, and that, you know, since Randy burned down a uh, freaking the Wyatt compound and Abigail's remains, that the fiend would burn Randy, and, you know, the whole cycle of revenge would be complete, and then we'd go on to whatever. But no, Randy ended up freaking burning the fiend to death so oh there's five weeks and six days until the royal rumble on january 31st so i would keep whatever the next reveal for the fiend maybe the whole entire funhouse for that matter off tv for a couple weeks because this much time between pay-per-views is probably going to stretch things out a little too far for a lot of stories going into the rumble honestly then yeah, pull the trigger on whatever the next stage is that I couldn't possibly guess, and Alexa will most likely be back by then. Or maybe he just shows back up tonight. I really do not know. I guess we'll see. No telling what's happening in Raw tonight. But SmackDown on Christmas will of course have Big E vs. Sami Zayn for the Intercontinental Championship, and Roman Reigns vs. Kevin Owens in a steel cage match. So yes, give me all of that. And also, definitely fingers crossed for Raw, though, because, I mean, I hate to be a negative Nancy, but, I don't know, the last week's Raw just didn't sit that much tight with me. I mean, besi besides the whole, you know, Randy Orton burning the box and the Fiend going, Arr, that was pretty awesome to me, you know, Arr. cue uh, Fall Horseman bloopers on that one, and... Yeah, but other than that, it was just, like, too much shenanigans. And I don't want to down Raw because, you know, I, that's my whole history with that. And my whole two and a half history with that is just... Because Raw was just, when I first started watching it, felt like a breath of fresh air. Because I was no longer ending my Mondays, you know, at yet another boring-ass retail apparel job. Or ending my day at the bar but it was just going home watching raw and then eventually you know getting up doing stock doing this podcast and then watching raw and it just felt like such a complete good day that i could just really start my week on and then eventually have to spend the rest of the week go doing all sorts of bullshit, some self-inflicted, some not, that I would eventually need the next Monday to, you know, refresh and really get myself centered on 
so yeah raw definitely uh means a lot to me so to just sit there or lay there and just be like oh what are all these shenanigans just like no i want to be a positive pete about this because watching raw on mondays two and a half years ago helped get me on the start of a more positive pete outlook so come on raw let's do better and that's the one, two, three. I know this is actually not going to be a 50 minute episode. Ha <laughs> ha! Oh, thank goodness. Uh, I mean, I usually try to keep these about 30 minutes. And if it ends up being 20 minutes, I mean, that's cool with me. But the last few weeks, I just ramble on long enough that it ends up being 50 minutes. So, I mean, either you'll like it or you don't. But anyway, thanks for locking up with me in the Ring of Thunder. And I hope you have a Merry Christmas if you celebrate. And if you don't, I hope you enjoy the holiday that you do celebrate. And that you also have a great day on the 25th. This has been a broadcast of the ESO Network. Be part of the crew and help support our shows by donating to our ESO Patreon or by shopping for the Tee Public Store, which can all be found at www.esonetwork.com. The ESO Network, your station for all things geek.